Hey everyone, Brian Beeler here alongside my good friend Rick Vanover from Veeam. Rick. Hey Brian, how are you? I, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm great, man. I'm like stoked to be here. I'm stoked to do this. Um, I brought gifts as you saw opening here. Yeah, we do have the gifts. So as a reminder, as we're going through the, uh, the stream today, feel free to post your questions and we will get to those. And you've got a couple raspberry pies there. Yep. I'm going to give away both of those raspberry pies. We'll... Uh, I guess Lucy's going to manage that. The social team's going to manage the, the best. Lucy will select two winners, and you'll send them some pie. I already had a question today about okay. how we were going to ship the raspberry pie, uh, but the person who asked it was expecting actual pie. <laughs> when I explained the situation, no. uh, she still informed me she would prefer the pie, so uh, you might have some work to do. Well, we might have leftover sausages, but... Uh, <laughs> we do have a... Rick... So it doesn't seem entirely odd. Rick brought a bunch of his favorite uh, sausages from Columbus down to the team here in Cincinnati, and we will be uh, enjoying those this weekend, I'm sure. I don't think they care about sausages so much as the topic at hand. And Saving bacon. Let's just do that. We'll save some bacon. We're talking ransomware. Help me out, Rick. How do you guys at Veeam think about ransomware? Kind of what is it in your view? It's really a preparedness strategy. I've... Uh taken this on the product team as my specialization. Like, so everyone on the team, like we know speeds and feeds of our products. We know nuts and bolts. We know our partners. We know the integrations we have with storage and cloud and, and platforms. But we also, everyone on my team, I, I, want, I want everyone to have like one more thing. You know, okay. we have some people uh, focusing on cloud native apps and storage integrations or uh, the cloud and security. I've taken ransomware. And that's almost a separate conversation from security because we, we talk to companies that deal with ransomware and they're concerned they're scared they've been through it right and if we were having well, how many stories do we have to hear every week about some oh, other company yeah. getting hit by ransomware yeah it, and there will be there will be more uh, in this day and age and it's this is a battle that i'm working diligently to bring information to the market to help people win and some of this information if you're using beam great if you're not this will actually still apply to you right but the thought is I just want to give the tips and tricks to win because okay. I talk a lot to customers who beat ransomware and the consistent response is, thank goodness I had backups or thank goodness I had a backup here or this way. Well, the reality is if you don't, this could be game over if you get hit the wrong way by the wrong guys. It would be absolutely an end of day situation yeah. or a conscious loss of data mm. or an unplanned spend or insurance claim, right? Which is another type of... If you have insurance. I mean, there's so yeah, much there, right? Right, right? Because you can't just roll into your local State Farm agent and be like, pay up because uh, my business got destroyed. Yeah, maybe. And we've been talking a lot about it here in our office because not that we worry so much about ransomware with our data. Kevin deletes everything all the time anyway, on purpose and otherwise. But uh, we were talking with a small business, and I know you'll probably have some good examples of ransomware, but a small medical practice, and it seems like those guys are getting targeted because maybe they're perceived to have the money to pay, but these guys got eaten up on this thing. It took a week and a half, and, and their, their bill to their service provider was like north of 10 k mm. Like, no one budgets for that, right? No. Well, but the thing is, north of 10 k or whatever it might cost to remediate that type of problem, it's way better to invest up front to prepare for this type of problem. Which is also another thing that's sometimes hard with slender IT budgets is to convince your boss who may or may not be well versed in the ideas of ransomware that it's important. And we're gonna get into some of this, but whose job is it to guard against ransomware in an organization? Is it IT, is it apps, is it the backup guy if you're in a larger mm -hmm. org and have these, these distinct functions? If it's a smaller org and you have a generalist, is it that guy? Is it your service provider? Like, what are we looking at here in terms of responsibility? So, well, why don't we go to the, the screen? Because I believe it or not, I even prepared for some of this, Brian. I'm shocked so, that you're here at all, honestly. <laughs> so let me just build this out really as a framework. And if you think about different personas in an organization, who is in charge of identifying data? Who is in charge of protecting data? Who's in charge of detecting threats? Who's in charge of responding to incidents? Who's in charge of recovery? If you would break out those five frameworks or five responsibilities, I love to apply Veeam capabilities there. And you know, for some organizations, it's the same person for all things. Right. But these are Veeam features, but the reality is we can take this type of framework approach 
that will walk you through, honestly, on the early side with identification, what data do you have, right? And you, you honestly should know that anyways. And this type of framework can help identify that persona, but who's gonna be the hero? It's the person who restores the data. You could also uh, have heroes made from a detection standpoint. Now, I'll be very clear. Veeam cannot be all things detection for this, right? We are a backup software provider. We, mm -hmm. might, we might see some behavior in other places, and I'll show you that here in a bit. But, you know, we're not on the wire when things come in. Sure. You know, we're not that content filter type of uh, approach. But I think you want multiple types of detection engines. But I look at it to that question, I would throw the framework up like this. Well, it's interesting because you're talking about what Veeam does or what, if someone's crazy, perhaps some other application for backup and recovery does. But in, actually, in the last two weeks, this has come up in both podcasts with uh, uh, the Exagrid podcast where we're talking about, and we'll get into some of that too, where they've got some protections in place. And mm -hmm. I know you're, you're close to, to those guys. And then uh, this week, we were talking with uh, Pure Storage about how they use their safety uh, snapshots to safe mode, safe say, yeah, yeah, mode. yeah, right. To to protect it, and so we're starting to see the situation where across the stack. So I asked you first about job roles, and now looking at where in your stack do you defend against this thing, and we're looking at backup and recovery, and we're looking at at uh, your storage targets, and we're looking at some of these other places. Uh, you know, with what Veeam does, I'll let you get specific here. Just what are your thoughts on? on the right integration points there to understand the data, as you said, but also to make sure you're protecting it the right way. Well, I think understanding the data is a very good first step. And then you have to have this balance of, this is the resiliency level we want to achieve. And maybe these are the pieces and parts we have. Like for example, maybe an organization is 100% cloud or cloud first, unless, okay. you know, or maybe they're like, Cloud not yet, so maybe we're still going to look for on-premises storage investments, right? So you have to look at the, the technology climate, you have to look at the pieces and parts, you have to look at the people involved. And I then break it down into these three rules here on screen. The first thing is education, and you only have to go to the news to know that the risk is out there. I think the education is very important, and it's more about educating not just what other organizations are going through, but what are the behaviors? What are... Um, and actually, I'll, I'll throw this out to you, Brian. I mean, we talked about this. Believe it or not, we do prepare, but um, <laughs> sometimes. You know, what are some of the most frequent modes of entry, you know, for ransomware? And that's one of those things that a lot of people actually don't know. I, I grew up thinking it was all fish or maybe somebody puts in a USB drive that has malware on it. But remote access done wrong is actually one of the most popular ways in. And then other things like software vulnerabilities and updates not being done. Well, we, we see that all the time, right? And even just, what do you have to go back three weeks to look at the Garmin example, to look at the Tesla example where, where they were trying to pay this guy to get a USB drive inside the system, uh, to think about all the people that work in an organization that have email and click on links to win free gift cards that now you've got something on, on your system. I mean, the, the points of entry are, are vast and varied. And I think that comes gets to the point where some people just, like I, like I keep peppering you with these questions, they just don't know what to do. So we can look at the failures of all these other guys and some of them remediate, which is good. Some of them pay, which is less good, but there seems to be at least some degree of honor amongst ransomware people that if you pay, they typically give it back, don't they, or give you the key? Um, I don't know, I've heard Sometimes that doesn't play out that way. But, um, you know, luckily I've never directly had it in, in my lab. I had a scare recently, though. Some weird stuff happened at home. But, you know, I'm, like, I'm almost like bring it on, you know, because uh, <laughs> I'm prepared at home because we, right. we have payroll data for the household employees and stuff. Right. But, um, you know, I think the Tesla example is actually a very good example of where education won and really completely mitigated the threat because it didn't even happen, you know? It didn't happen, but it sure is scary to think about what they offer them like a million dollars or something to, to go do that. Well, that link didn't work, but right. there's gonna be a weak link in the chain. And the bigger the organization gets, the bigger the mistakes get amplified, it seems Right, like. or the other way around, you know, you could have an internal threat actor rather than a bribed threat actor. 
You so, know, someone disgruntled or angry or... Yeah, malicious administrator, accidental type scenarios. You almost have to conflate ransomware into that neighborhood where the strategy, or even with a disaster as well. In fact, one organization I, I had at VMON in June, Brett had beat ransomware by having DR done right. Okay. But we're supposed to have that right anyways, you know? So... The thought is... That's the scary thing, is how yeah. much of this is really done right. And it's one thing that we've seen a lot of is bad backup, so that no one ever tests their backup, so they can know if they can recover. Right. So they're sending stuff over, but then can't bring it back. With ransomware, it's a similar thing. So you talked a lot about education for users and administrators, right? Uh, implementation, which is some of what we're talking about here. Yeah, that's exactly the next segue. Once you understand the threatscape and you hear how organizations get out of it, the most specific thing you can do to prepare yourself is implement your backup and recovery technology. And then it leads you to the last step of remediation, where if you know what type of threat you're dealing with, if you know that you have implemented things well, you're prepared to restore. You're getting some support for end users being the worst on the, on the chat, by the way. Hey now, <laughs> and I think that that's important because um, especially from a network standpoint, the PC in a workplace is the entry point for many situations, right? And I'll also flip that around and that ransomware is absolutely not just a PC problem, but it could be introduced that way. Right. You know, so Veeam support has actually restructured their operations to help customers out of this problem. And I love going down and talking to them about what do you see? What do you recommend people do? And they have a very specific kind of process, but kind of the interesting thing is that they actually will, and I'll jump to that um, as well, come back to this in a second. Do, 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 do. Their thanks, advice. Thanks for the music production. Yeah, 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 that's you're that's pretty nice. Yeah, you're welcome. But anyways, they gave me three things. When they win, it's because of the top thing. There's some form of an ultra resilient copy of backup data. That, All right, let's let's talk about this. I know you're down on yeah. down down with this concept of ultra resilient. Yeah. What's ultra resilient? Well, it's, you know... We already had HA pairs. We had other stuff that's resilient. And now we've got ultra resilient. Ultra resilient. Okay, yeah. and what does that mean? So that is... We need a definition here. So that is the single most effective specimen to beat a threat like this. And I have four of them on this list of six. That I, I thought I, you were the single most specimen. Uh, specimen. <laughs> Interesting. No, no. I'm, a, I'm just a evangelist of this stuff, okay. man. But like these four storage techniques, we feel at Veeam are your best way to mitigate ransomware. And they all have their own interesting different characteristics. So let's start with uh, tape. Right? That tape's dead, man. Everyone has a story of tape letting them down. Not going to lie, okay? <laughs> but like worm media or tape media outside of the library is actually fairly resilient, Okay. That's one way to do it. We talked we talked about that, but it's it's old. See, I always worry about the age of the data. So if we uh -huh. so if we get a ransomware situation, and I know we'll get into this, if you're having to go to tape, you're talking about data that's probably a month old. Uh, you know, see, you've made an assumption there. Okay. I spoke to an organization in Switzerland that actually is more progressive to cloud, but they had a tape infrastructure, and they're only putting the last seven days on tape. And that's okay. it. Don't, you know, don't say tape and think of eight-year library. Well, I just did. I know. Okay, Make well, you fixed it. All right, okay. good. Carry on. But that's well, that's one organization. Not everybody does it that way. Okay. But then, you know, tape may not be um, a strategic investment today. But if you have it, you know, think about it. Um, kind of on the bottom of this list, more progressive is immutable backups. And that's one of the demos I'll show here in a bit. So we've talked about this and we write about it sometimes, but the immutable word may not be broadly understood. What do you mean when you say immutable backups? So I was talking to a customer who majored in English and he asked me that same question. What I mean by immutable is... Wait, you had an English major working in IT? IT yeah. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. But anyways, immutable just means you can't change it, you can't delete it. And if you think about your backup data, that becomes a very interesting proposition. And you see this a lot of different ways. Uh, Exagrid has a capability coming, I think, this month. The 19th. They broke it on the, uh, he pre-announced pre it on the podcast. Oh, interesting. We get very hot news on the podcast. I know, I know. Not when you're on, but when other people do it. Thank you. But anyways, 
um, uh, so you'll see storage systems doing that type of thing. We talked about uh, pure safe mode snapshots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those kind of behave that way. So I have that in the middle as a primary storage snapshot. Same thing with like a NetApp snap lock. And there might be others uh, out there depending on what you have. But like this is a framework that you cannot just go delete. So that's what I mean by immutable. And uh, in the backup console of Veeam, I can't delete it. But that's also good because it helps us against ransomware. Also, think about new administrator, first day on the job, accidental deletion, right? Yeah. Um, malicious administrator as well. These other different threatscapes are are protected from that. And so cloud's very pro uh, progressive and new. A lot of people like that. Then you can also implement some offline storages as well, like rotating hard drives, RDX drives, that type of thing. Um, and then in the middle, the Cloud Connect with insider protection, that's a Veeam technology that's actually been out for three or four years. And this is, I want to give a shout out to my service providers. I know uh, probably have Jim Jim Jones watching on the stream here. He's shout saying, out to Jim Jones. Shout out to Jim Jones. All right. Um, so, you know, for example, he works at Offsite Data Sync, which is a service provider, and they provide backups as a service. So if I'm like an organization, to your earlier point, Brian, it's like we all have IT fatigue, and there might not be a means to go start and do something to address this threat. That's the beautiful thing about Veeam is you can use a service provider to do it just like that. Well, that's that's good to have. I already got all sorts of backlash for my t just a little joke about tape. I mean, everyone chill out. Ryan, you chill out. Chris, William, all of you, Brandon, uh, and we did get some some hate for administrators too, not just there the end go. users. Well, <laughs> so depends. we're having a little bit of battle. It depends on the admin, right? <laughs> it, it does depend you know, on the admin. I think it's the the weakest link in the chain, and it might not be an end user. We've got two tape comments worth checking out. Uh, not going to find a more effective way to get backups offsite for FM, SMB with tape. Mm -hmm. And uh, Patrick says never never underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon filled with backup tapes. Hey now, on a per terabyte basis, that guy's not joking around. I am gonna get that as my first tattoo. Uh, we can arrange for that after this. <laughs> that is awesome. You know, I I will translate that another way and say that the acquisition cost. And the portability of tape really cannot be beat plus the bandwidth, no, bandwidth I, of the station wagon. Slam them in a station wagon <laughs> or one of those old uh, Chrysler minivans, the early ones oh, that had yeah. the wood panel yeah, sides on there. Oh, yeah, man, those were hot. Perfect for carrying all the tapes you want. U-Haul. Like, oh, you name yeah, it. Absolutely. What were we talking about? Oh, um, tape. Tape. And, oh, yeah. Uh, we were back on tape. Somewhere. All right. So we've got your uh, your immutability. We've got your various types of uh, of storage and various ways to combat um, ransomware throughout the stack. Mm -hmm. Does everyone know about this? Well, does everyone I, think about it this way? I hope they do. I've worked very hard to put up some implementation resources here that I've got. Prepared. Don't come in here hawking your links, sir. <laughs> Hey, well, I think it's important. The last one, okay, fine. And I wrote a white paper, and it's 30 pages, and I'm sorry it's long. I'm glad you put all those letters in there. You could have used a bit.ly link. The bottom one is. It's a Veeamly. Well, it's still pretty long. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we'll put it in the, uh, in, the, in the descriptive notes for people that want to check that out uh, after this is over. Yeah, but uh, we have a ransomware content library of sorts that is an important way, I think, that people can practically consume this information, especially if you're a decision maker, if you're an IT admin, uh, the whole persona map for sure. And then the other thing I'll highlight is, you know, I talked about education, implementation, and remediation. When I kind of overlay that into how you can practically get started, you know, these features are good, right? Don't get me wrong. And I've covered a lot of these in that paper, actually all of these and this is kind of the recipe of where it sits. It's like a different view of that framework where we started, right? Mm -hmm. So the thought here is, you know, sometimes people and processes are some of the hardest things. Are you adopting that three, two, one rule? When I talk to support, they're like, if they don't have that extra copy or if they haven't implemented separation and roles and, you know, explicit minimal permissions and not putting well, the three, two, on. one thing is so basic and still yeah. people may not even know this is your three copies, two media or two sites, one in the, one in the cloud. What, no, what is it? No, right? you've totally three, it. Bad two job. sites, three copies. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> the three, two, one rule. Actually, I believe it started in the, the era of the dawn of digital photography. And it was a mindset to not lose your work. 
Well, that's a good mindset. We don't yeah. want to lose our work. And the thought is, let's have three different copies of data on two different media. I said that. One of which off-site. Ah, the off-site. Yes. I said in the cloud, that's off-site. It could be. I yeah. still get partial credit for that. Well, we, we at Veeam, we've taken it a little bit. We've Veeamed it up a little bit. Yeah. We, we've gone 32110. It is the zip code of ultimate availability. Okay? So that's three different copies of your data, two different media, one of which is off-site, one of which is offline or ultra-resilient. Why, on a Friday before a holiday, why would I torture myself with this interaction well, of your zip code of availability? I brought you sausages. <laughs> That's true. All right. <laughs> Are we going to do, we're going to do some demos too, or do you have uh, some other additional things you want to share with uh, us? No, we can go right into demo. All right. Let's take a look at that while we're getting the demo set up. Just a reminder that post your questions, your comments, your I gotta say the the clubhouse leader could be the comment around the uh, tapes jammed in a uh, the bandwidth of a station, of a station wagon, wagon full of tapes. That is that is gold. I bet it's what does it what does it smell like in that uh, station wagon full of tapes? Probably like some used Marlboros or something. Uh, right? Do they still make station wagons? They must. They but, must. Yeah. Kevin calls them sport wagons now. I think the sport German wagons. the German cars. Oh, okay, sure. Anyway, get your comments in, questions, and uh, some of these prizes could be yours. Those two Raspberry Pis are going out. We've non edible. Got, uh, non edible. <laughs> we've got uh, uh, ten or twelve pairs of socks. So we'll uh, we'll find some winners and and get that out there. Hey, real quick, before you get too far down the road on the demo, uh, we did have a question come in early on that I was uh, wanted to make sure we got before everyone started pointing fingers at whose fault all of this is. Uh -oh. uh, there's a question around uh, from Chris, does it integrate with Horizon desktops and user persistent disk? Well, it's funny, uh, Chris, as I'm actually using Horizon to drive my demo. So Veeam doesn't integrate as a virtual machine layer to most um, non-persistent desktops. Uh, and that comes down to the storage configuration and I um, I forget the specific terms but you know if you need like backups of that you know I've always said to work on the policy for you know user documents first and you know centralize that and then and, you know have Veeam focus that then beyond that you can implement Veeam with the NAS backup engine to start backing up those types of data sets and then you could also think about the agent for Windows, and okay. the agent for Linux. So there's so many different ways to rearrange this um, menu of backup capabilities. But I, you know, a lot of times people think I have these bunch of VMs. I want Veeam backup and replication right. for VMware. But for a lot of the VDI deployments, there's a disk configuration that we can't support to backup agentlessly. So we have to go in it another way. So things like uh, the NAS backup, things like Veeam agent for Windows, things like profile management. And you can also use Veeam 1, by the way, what we're looking at right now, yeah, because uh, this alarm here, I'm gonna, how do you like my zoom in? This possible ransomware activity alarm is actually gonna look at VMware in Hyper-V environments for some behavior that may be associated with CPU high usage and then high write rate. Hmm. We can configure this, right? But like the thresholds, you know, how aggressive it is and such. But the magic here is this is available for both VMware and Hyper-V. I can take this alarm, and it's one thing to have an alarm that I, you know, have sitting out there that nobody looks at, but I can actually do a little bit more aggressive types of things. I could run a script that pages me, might be a little bit more... Uh, you wear a pager? Text. I saw it on your Whatever. hip. Don't you lie. I saw that on your hip. That well, translucent some, gray in case. I remember that one from 97. Uh, some form of like notification that okay. people will look at. Okay? So old. Um, we could even shut down that virtual machine. We could go that far, right? We could take a backup and shut it down or shut it down and take a backup. So, so this gets to the point, though, of being proactive. Absolutely. And, and, and trying to find yeah. out when that thing happened. Because as we said at the beginning, that not knowing of when something happened is the scariest part. Yeah. Because then what do you do? You recover from yesterday or the day before? or the day, like Right. Cut it off now, right? Cut, mitigate the risk. And right. this, this remediation action, we call it, is by approval, but we could also have an automated way that that automatically sorted out. And there's some built-in script activities you can do. So you can actually take this ransomware activity alarm, and I'll give a shout-out to Melissa Palmer. She is on my team. She calls herself the Veeam One Witch. 
But she has made some. <laughs> I'm very... glad she gave herself that moniker yeah. and not you. Yeah. So go on over on Twitter. Her and I and Kirsten on my team, we have made the Veeam One catch of the day. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like every day, we're trying to share something of interest. So if I go over here, for example, and if you go to Twitter, uh, let's see if we're I. Gonna play along the home game now you're on a you're on a visitor's keyboard it's a little bit more challenging uh yeah this is interesting but if i go to twitter which um i think i can do this without logging in maybe not actually but anyways uh the thought is veeam one catch of the day so veeam one cotd we made a hashtag with it and every day we're sharing what we can and she had a great one yesterday what was it about you better, you better about uh, ransomware and okay. remediation actions okay and then so this is one type of way to detect right on an infrastructure level high CPU, high writes. The other capability that Veeam has on the detection side, which is rather awesome. Here, before you go too yeah. far, we're getting a question about what exactly we're looking at right here for those uninitiated. Uh, this is Veeam 1. Okay. Veeam's management monitoring analytics type product. Mm -hmm. And I'm working kind of backwards, right? Like on the detection side. So the thought is I want to be backing up anyways, but I want to highlight the potential of detecting ransomware. And that's what Veeam 1's possible ransomware activity alarm can do for us. By the way, that's available for free. The ransomware alarm? Yeah, the okay. possible ransomware activity alarm. And for those that don't know Veeam specifically, how you describe what Veeam 1 is, but how do you get it? Do you have to use it? Do you opt into this? Do you Can you just use the backup without Veeam 1? How does all that Actually, work? that's a good point. So if you go on over to veeam.com, and if you go to our products, you know, for those of you new to Veeam, Veeam Avail Availability Suite, and then more specifically Veeam One, including the free edition or the trial, uh, community edition or a trial, you can use this standalone. It can look at just VMware and Hyper-V environments and provide you that, that infrastructure alerting. And here's something I like to say. I guarantee you that Veeam One will tell you something about your environment that you didn't know, but you need to fix. Really? Guarantee it. You think everyone that tries this out has Guaranteed. got something broken in their environment? Ha, shout at me at Twitter if I'm wrong. I'm serious. Shout at me because I'll give you his address and then you can really shout at him if he's wrong. Noted. <laughs> but right. uh, detection. All right, back to V1. Yeah, no worries. Detection is important, right? So the first scenario I highlighted was detecting that possible activity on the infrastructure level. But guess what? Veeam also does the backups. Now this is not available in the free edition, but one other thing that Veeam has as a capability is this notion of a suspicious, do you like pink? It's fine. How about red? Because that's bad. A suspicious incremental backup size. And what does that mean? Like change rate well over normal and Okay. Really, maybe a hundred percent change rate. That's not normal. So your your typical incrementals for a daily or hourly or whatever would 10%. be a, 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 reg, a regular number. Yeah. And so if you see a big lumpy change, like what's going on? Okay. Yeah. Now That's, that could be a yeah. Clue. We might catch it on the um, on the backup because maybe if things start getting encrypted quickly, we would catch that this way. Uh, this example, we had some really high change rate because we deployed a bunch of stuff. Now that was a false positive. That's okay. Well, but I'd rather I have the false it. positive to respond to, unless yeah. unless it's too many, and then it becomes cumbersome, yeah. like the false alarms that no one listens to. Right. After who who responds to a car alarm anymore? Well, that possible ransomware activity alarm, by the way, I've only been able to trigger it once. Okay. Right? So it's pretty accurate. We've tuned those numbers over time. And well, I, even if it's not ransomware, it's probably something else. Yeah, I mean, you, or it could be. So it could it's worth be. checking out, right? I used an I/O simulator to do it, mm -hmm. right? And that's how, because it was a lot of CPU and just straight through a lot of writing of dev random data, right? So that was the behavior that matched. But the thought is, this type of visibility, again, for where we sit in the technology stack, can be helpful for people. So you're talking about alarms. It's a good time for another question. Can possible ransomware activity alarms be triggered from uh, vRealize Ops, or does a user agent need to be installed on the VM. Oh, good point. Uh, this particular alarm that we mentioned about possible ransomware activity available for both VMware and Hyper-V, it's not currently implemented for vRealize anything, uh, but this is agentless. Okay. okay, so this detection is done by Veeam querying vCenter, an individual ESXi host, Agentlessly, same thing over on Hyper-V Town. 
we're going to look at a SCVMM cluster, a Hyper-V failover cluster, or individual Hyper-V hosts. So two questions on the uh, change rate thing. One is, if we're thinking about ransomware coming in, the files themselves aren't big, so you're not going to see a big lumpy executable deployment maybe. Are the encrypted files, do they tend to get bigger? Like what do you guys see in, time, in terms of understanding file size impacts? So what we would see is, I'll just make up an example of a application server that also has like a bunch of files on it. And let's just say it's normally 100 gigabytes on a full backup. And the incremental on this, maybe we're looking at two to six gigabytes change rate. If the bunch of files gets touched by a threat actor like that, you might see 90, cha 90 gigabytes change rate or, or some very if those, high number. Okay, so if a bunch of those 10, 20, 100K files get modified, right. then that's when you're seeing it tick into that. Yes. That needs to be backed up. So the follow-up, or you kind of addressed it there, is how's change rate determined? It's just simple math for you, right, in terms of the the backup size, then what, what you're... We get, it, we, we get it from the platform for VMware and Hyper-V environments. So VMware provides us change block tracking. Uh, Hyper-V has RCT, Resilient Change Tracking. The Veeam agent for Windows and Linux have their own mechanisms, right? When we see this change rate, it, it comes from the platform. Now, more specifically, there's not like a file system monitor agent that's looking for this behavior. It's, right. it's as we capture for the backup, are we seeing change block tracking go through the roof? That's kind of how we okay. get to that number. Okay. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, I'll show you a backup job. So here's a Veeam backup and replication. So what I want to show you here is the actual capture. So I'm kind of going more specifically into the implementation side of things. I'm already doing monitoring with Veeam 1. But Veeam backup jobs are very straightforward and easy to set up. Uh, I love to say that Veeam is too hard to use, says no one ever. And the other side of it is we have a technology that allows organizations to leverage those ultra-resilient storage types. In this case, I'm going to use the cloud. So the scale-out backup repository, this is my favorite feature of Veeam Backup and Replication, and it's really included at no additional cost. Okay. So this is a software-defined at the management level secondary storage system that's completely scale out ready and cloud agnostic as well. So it's a really powerful engine. In fact, a lot of times people don't really get their head around how powerful this is. But the thought here is we can have this notion of a performance tier. Now I only have one extent here, but if I had multiple extents here, I could put policies around it, but namely the policy around keeping backups together or spreading it out for performance, which is kind of interesting if you think about that. If you have like uh, multi multiple storage systems, you could actually get some really significant performance. But in the context of what we're talking about for ransomware, I've prepared this today. So this is so powerful. What I'm doing with my backups, now this is where I'm putting my backups. Mm -hmm. Now you saw I'm going to the NAS target on-premises first, but I'm actually doing something rather awesome additionally. And let's use blue for that. I'm doing this technology here called copy mode that we have. And copy mode is going to copy backups to the object storage as soon as they're created. So I'm extending my backup storage to the S3 bucket. I'm going to get into that in a second. But once I take a backup on premises, uh, Brian, it immediately is copied to the cloud. Right. So to your point, like tape sometimes might have a lag. If I'm using the cloud, maybe it is only after two weeks. Not in this model. Mm -hmm. So I basically have hit the two of three, two, one mm -hmm. right here. So it's a really good way to get at it. And the other thing I'll highlight as a recommendation to Don't people. Don't you dare use a third color. Oh, you're going to break my Zoom at Mojo, man. I'll, I'll just get out of there. I can do four, but now I, <laughs> I tripped on this microphone cable with my finger at least. But the other recommendation here is to always encrypt that data up into the cloud, uh, into Amazon. So even if you maybe accidentally didn't secure your bucket correctly, uh, or your Azure Blob container that you um, have that data encrypted. Okay. So cool. it's, it's very straightforward. But what's magical is when I define, sorry, I was in the right place. When I define these backups here, I have a list of the different storage systems. So shout out to Exagrid as well, uh, a couple of different 
on-premises storage resources, but you'll see I have S3 immutable backups going on. So I'm going to hit press. I like that is your blob buffering too, don't you? I, I love blob. They don't have the immutability implemented in a practical way for us just yet. So the example I'm going to show you is Amazon. Right. But at some point in time, I'd love to be able to tell you about this type of capability over here, uh, but I don't have that at the ready just yet. Now, don't anybody look too closely at my half of my credential there. But what I do want to show you is that when I have a bucket identified, so I'm going to US East 2 in Ohio because my lab shares that. Uh, um, actually, it has a great connectivity. Even though it's like 12 miles away, it's basically local network for me at my lab here where this is running. But I have a nice little safeguard. How about blue? To limit my cloud consumption to 10 terabytes or I could drop down to a petabyte number. Now the thought is I don't want to have a runaway bill. Mm -hmm. But the magic here, Brian, is also this notion of making backups immutable for a specified number of days. So when I make these backups that were I just that were set for copy mode just a second ago, they will be put into this bucket immutable for seven days. So I cannot delete them. Now the bad thing is it increases my cost. So it, it gives you that little warning there. But the reality is, this is a great way to be resilient against this ransomware threatscape. So it's very easy to do. You can just set that up in your bucket as you create it. Now, the one thing I'll highlight is when you create the bucket in Amazon, you have to enable object block and compliance mode as you create the bucket. And the good thing is, we'll actually tell you, hey, you can't do that because it's not configured correctly. So it'll it, when it goes out and, and sniffs around yes. at the credentials and, and does that scan, it'll let you know? Right. When it authenticates, right. it'll, it'll get you and tell you it's not, this won't work because of the way it's configured. And, you know, the other thing is I realize a lot of organizations aren't ready to go to the public AWS S3. There's also a shed load of S3 compatible storage systems like uh, Zadara, Cloudian, Ceph. So anyone that talks S3. Not all of them have immutability. Oh, okay. So the immutability mm -hmm. is an extra thing that it's the Cloudian a, and some of those other guys yeah, have sorted out. Yeah, we let's uh, let's say if you know you're at home and you like this information and you want to see immutable and you'll just see let's see S3 compatible and we. This should, makes for good TV watching you search Google. Yes, exactly. So in our forum. We have um, we have a list that I can't find, but for one of them here, um, Minio has one, for example. It's on either the forums or some different KB articles. So there's a lot of different uh, platforms that organizations might want for S3 compatible type storages. And then the one kind of tease I'll give that in June, we had Vmon 2020, and we announced that we're going to support Glacier and Azure Deep Archive. Those are going to be a new tier. So what I was showing you before was the performance tier, and the cloud is the capacity tier, and Deep Archive and Glacier are going to be the archive tier. Cost cost optimized even further. Yeah, right? and they're actually going to be that when we put backups in there, they'll be removed from the console. So that's going to be. I don't know if I'll call it ultra resilient. I'll call it ultra resilient. I don't know if I'll call it immutable. No, you'll probably make up a new word. New one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, while we're talking S3, uh, we've got a question that came in. Is Veeam thinking about putting out their own S3 compatible immutable storage system for larger organizations or MSPs? No. You don't want to get in that business? Um, you know, one thing I'll say about Veeam is that partners are in our DNA. Partnerships are in our DNA. And if you think about how Veeam goes to market with service providers, with uh, cloud platforms, with on-premises platforms like VMware, Microsoft, and you know, we're doing some stuff with Linux and the storage integrations of, you know, days and days of that. It doesn't make sense for us to make our own technology. Same thing about the appliance question. Right. It's just not in Veeam's interest. We are laser focused on being a backup software provider and integrating. I mean, we'd probably integrate with the power company if it made sense. Well, sometimes those integrations, though, do take the form of physical stuff. So mm, maybe yeah. I think in, in people's mind as they think about what's Veeam and what's not Veeam, they still sometimes see a lot of Veeam stuff bundled together with, with either converged solutions sure. or whatever, right? Yeah, like Nutanix Mines, Cisco yeah, mine Availability and HyperFlex, right. uh, what we're doing with Exagrid, where it's rather coupled, right. and, and there will be more. 
and and then other scenarios like the storage snapshot integration and other purpose-built backup appliance integrations like data domain boost and HPE store once and the quantum DXI platform so it, there's a lot out there and right. that's back to the first point of what do we have what do we have investments in what's our strategy as an IT company chances are I can find a way with a Veeam integration to make, to make it work yeah not just to make it work to make, to make a it, difference okay all right and while we're talking about making a difference, yeah. make sure to keep those questions in as we uh, as we keep going here because we're going to do a little more demo work. But uh, Lucy will be selecting uh, two of these Raspberry Pi winners out of the comments, so make sure to get your comment in. That's also your entry, and uh, we'll do that at the uh, at the end. Lucy will put that in the notes for you guys. So I want to highlight something. So I've kicked off the backup job. So I explained that we're backing up to AWS. Right. And I explained that copy mode. And I want to highlight something, Brian, that actually is rather quick how it works. So what we have going on right now is, well, I'm... I'm copying SQL logs at all times with example four. So my, um, I have a SQL database. I'm always picking up the logs. But you'll see at the top here, example 10. Yes. That backup job has just kicked off. And uh, it's taking a look here. It's going to run. It takes about two minutes to run an increment here. But what I want to highlight is once it runs, it has four virtual machines that we're going to pick them up. Now, I'll admit these are not huge, but they are nice and small to fit inside for the demo. So they're just, you know, itsy bitsies, but that's okay. It's proving a point. So I'm gonna back up these four virtual machines and remember that copy mode? So what, what, when I take an incremental backup, I'm gonna put that increment on premises on that NAS share, but then I'm immediately going to copy that over to that immutable bucket in S3. And the magic part of that is that I immediately have that copy off site. So if I look, this ran at two o'clock right before we came, came in and well, I said it took two minutes. This one actually took three minutes and 51 seconds. But the thing you I wanna highlight is that you'll see this job right here called sober tiering. And sober stands for scale out backup. Yeah, I'm out on that. Oh, that's what that means. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> scale out backup I was long gone on that. No, no, come on, come on. The, the tiering, right? We're working those tiers. So once we have that backup job, we'll immediately send it up to the cloud. And it is so specific here that once that individual virtual machine's restore point is completed, it will go. So if I look over here, of course it's slow and I'm waiting on it, but basically these two are going to go first. So MISCO1 and MISCO2, they'll be done first. And then before even three and four are done, there'll be a cloud transmission underway so we'll let that go for a second but it's like this policy engine is what i'm what i'm getting at this policy engine is basically immediate so you'll see misco two and one just finished up and as we're watching here you're going to see a silver tiering job start taking parts of this to the cloud immediately before uh, misco three and four are even getting done hmm. now the magic also by the way brian and i need your help so I've made up the word ultra resilient. Yeah. So you've heard of compression. You, yes, thank you. I'm yes. aware of that. <laughs> we're compressing these backups. Okay, good. We're also doing duplication, deduplication. Oh, you're duplicating the <laughs> no. backups. We're That's doing, fantastic on your bandwidth charges in we're the We're doing Amazon. deduplication. Deduplication. That, there it is. The yes. Silver tiering, by the way. Um, if in other situations we have a technology where if we move data on premises with a copy job, we have a WAN acceleration technique. So I've kind of enumerated three different storage efficiency or data reduction techniques. Those are all built in with Veeam with no additional cost, but I need some help. I'm ready. We share metadata of these backups with what we've written in the cloud. So imagine if I've got some you know, blocks and stuff like that, and I pick those up and take those into pages into the object storage. I have this metadata map of what's where. The beautiful thing about that is if I have duplicate ones, I won't send them again. So okay. it's, it's not deduplication, but I'm preventing duplication. It's an efficient send. We've been calling it no dupe. <laughs> hey, let's go to a question, Rick. <laughs> Lots of talk about the benefits and features for the big guys like VMware and Hyper-V. Any benefits of Veeam over other backup solutions for the small guys like Proxmox? And I think this question gets gets to the um, crux of what home labbers are thinking about, of what uh, guys are thinking about as they demo and, and, and mess with gear. 
And Veeam's always been real community friendly on yes on that front. And that's you know, if you go back a decade, some of the way you guys got into market was by making it easy to pick up and go and, and tinker with. So, what what do we do for uh, our Proxmox friend? So one thing I'll highlight is there's an incredible level of versatility with Veeam solutions. And this system that I'm dem demoing you on, mm -hmm. or demoing for you, mm -hmm. this is actually a Windows 10 system, but I'm not gonna do the updates right now. Yeah, but, we don't need that. No, we don't need that. But basically, I'm on Windows, uh, no, I don't wanna change the display, sorry. I promise I've used computers before today. I'm not sure. Um, this is my Windows desktop somewhere, it'll, yeah, Windows 10. So I'm doing this on Windows 10. What I'm getting at is this isn't like what I'm showing you here isn't necessarily a huge server deployment. And for those of you wanting to start small, I highly recommend if you go to veeam.com into the free product section, Veeam Backup and Replication Community Edition, you can back up 10 instances for free. So 10 virtual machines or 10 physical servers or five and five or eight and two or two and eight. Jim Jones is getting, uh, getting, yeah, Beat up a little bit on the chat for being late, but he's here now. He missed his initial shout out. Oh, so. Jim, I gave you a shout out and I said, there's so much value of a service provider like offsite data. Talk about duplication, having to duplicate, duplicate. the shout outs now. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, uh, an idea of duplicati for du your. For no, your no. Um, how about no duplicati? <laughs> it's a spaceless full backups where, you know, different pieces can not be duplicated. I, I have a picture for it, but not prepared. <laughs> it's interesting. There's a we've got a interesting take on ransomware. Wouldn't you say that uh, S3 is kind of like ransomware because you have to pay to get your data back? Not gonna answer that. Egress. Oh. Egress is real. Well, Actually, it the, doesn't. Ha does it have to be? Um, that's a good point because let's assume you're doing a restore from the cloud, from either Amazon or Azure. The way this metadata and the spaceless full backups, this intelligent transfer of data to the object storage works, if there is a block on premises that has a metadata match of a page in the cloud, we won't bring it down. So there's actually some very efficient built-in egress preventing techniques with the way we've implemented the cloud tier, the capacity tier. So um, yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to call it ransomware. It was in quotes, it was just a little joke, man. Taking it too seriously. But what about guys like, I know they don't have it yet, or I don't think they have it yet, but Wasabi, who's a Veeam partner, now they've really made their business on uh, not nailing you on the egress. Is there a play for them eventually as part of this? So at last I remember, Wasabi supports S3 compatible with right. us, but I don't believe they have the immutability. Right, I don't think they're there yet. Either. So, um, you know, I think, again, I have nothing but evidence after talking with customers who have won ransomware battles, and then our support team who has seen both sides of the, the battle. The number one most efficient specimen is something that's ultra resilient. You know, so immutability, uh, completely offline, those types of things. And you know, you talk, if you talk to organizations who have been through ransomware and survived, well, um, won and didn't have to pay the ransom, right. you'll find that they beat ransomware in different ways with these common threads of restoring a certain way, or the threats behave a different way. And that's actually very interesting because a lot of times people think it's just this massive rash of encryption. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's actually slow. There's this dwell time, this phenomenon. Oh, great to fester and make yeah, it even worse. Exactly. You know it's coming. Right, but then there's also threat actors that will actually extort your data. The ransom is actually to take it down from highest bidder, right? So there's that. Then there's other ransomware that the behavior is actually just deleting files and the ransom will make that stop. Uh, there's other, I actually got information from our support team where there was a ransomware that got infected with, on SQL servers. Hmm. And its behavior was it made a native SQL server encryption call oh. and would sell you the encryption key. Yeah. And the funny thing is that was really quick. Boom, and it, it actually, it was a native SQL call. So it was basically a fancy script. It wasn't even really a ransomware in the traditional sense. And those are just the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. And 
the, well, the threats, don't worry, every week you'll have something new to talk about with yes. the support team, unfortunately. Right. And, you know, I, we have some, we've done some surveys with our customers, and I have actually, I can't share you the numbers, but we are making very positive trends in what customers are doing, how likely they are to restore successfully, how little financial impact ransomware is causing. And we're preparing, uh, we haven't announced it yet, but in October, I think it's going to be October, we have a virtual event situation. I'm going to have two new users come on and tell their story. In addition okay. to the two different ones that I had from uh, from Vmon in June, and uh, I don't know Paul if you're out there if you're watching Paul from Alaska. Okay. He's uh, he's gonna he's gonna be on, and Paul's got a story. I uh, spoke with him last night. Well, I think the stories of of like the survivors group, right, is important to share those because I've never been in it, but I think when you're in it, I mean, the whole world must stop. And it, it is a disaster you did not want to start your day with. Yeah. There is no way to like be ready for this. Uh, I'll give an example from uh, Canada. Um, Dave Kawula, one of the Veeam vanguards, you know, it, one Monday morning, and it was a very bizarre situation. That one was super targeted, probably had some sort of insider help. Oh, that's brutal. Uh, and it was even, just to you know amplify the threat, Brian, the printers on the network were printing out the ransom notes. Too. Oh, no, the printers were involved? <laughs> the Those printers were involved. Sons of... so, I'm telling you. Is Paul in there? Did Paul, can you shout out? I bet no. Was, no, Paul Paul didn't say anything to you. He's, no. not, he's not in here, right. old man. Paul. Is he in here <laughs> somewhere? Oh. All right. Paul's my man. Like we've got another question. Uh, let's see. We've got a question from... Chris, on the transmission to the cloud storage, what happens when there's an internet outage during transmission? Is it queued to run again or try again later? Oh, uh, there's resync logic. Actually, that's a funny question from Chris. Um, every Veeam component has this like resiliency model built into it where we have to assume something breaks, something fails, something's not available, or something's not what we used to think it was, mm -hmm. okay? And one of the best examples is the cloud tier. So when we ran that backup capacity tier, I gotta stop calling it cloud tier. When we ran that backup and I put this backup here, let me just jam on it right here. Um, yeah, there we go. So I have backups on this example in both Amazon and Azure. And if I would go into the bucket I would have everything I need to restore this handful of virtual machines. Mm -hmm. If I would go into the Azure container, I would have everything I need to restore those virtual machines. If I destroyed this Windows 10 desktop, I would have everything I need on that NAS share. If I completely lost the lab in Columbus, but I had the bucket or I had the Azure blob container, I would have everything I need. That's one very important point is that Veeam backups are self-describing and, and very portable. And the thought is you can have the backup, but you don't necessarily need the console that wrote it. As long as you have the encryption key, then you're good to go. If I had known you were going to say that, this would have been a much better video if I had Kevin on live stream up in your office in Columbus with a baseball bat over your, uh, over actually, your machine. You, it's, this is actually at a, at a off-site data center. Uh, we counted to get in, it's nine-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. That's a couple. <laughs> Uh, we've got, uh, oh, so Chris was talking about he survived, uh, his org survived a ransomware with delayed backups, caught the ransomware before it was backed up in our offsite location because it's a one hour delay. Oh, that's, he got lucky. That is lucky. You got lucky, Chris. And, and again, you didn't necessarily beat it with uh, ultra resilient storage. You bought it, you beat it with a response time. And that's rather impressive, right? But again, um, you look at all these organizations who have won, and it's like, you don't want to ever say we got lucky here. We got lucky because of that. You don't want to have that as part of the mix. Right. So, uh, good catch there, Chris. Well, and I think too, as we think about what we were looking at before with some of the the warnings and notifications, and some of the stuff you guys are doing within uh, at Veeam, that those are the precursors to something bad about to happen. And and maybe Chris got lucky, but maybe you get that pager alert. Right. To, pager. You know, to your to your. Well, you know, the thought is maybe there's other detection techniques as yeah. well. Veeam detection is one detection technique, you know. I know Cisco has some magic. Um, Windows, Microsoft uh, Defender, ATP has some stuff. Well, it's going to be, it's going to have to get required, 
right? Because everyone's going to have to have a story on ransomware. It can't just be, if I'm a, a storage provider, infrastructure provider, it can't just be, well, you figure it out or, or go get an app. Right, or but I also think this is an opportunity when you assess the threat, especially if you listen to all the different types of people who have beat ransomware, you really want to have an arrangement in place where you have help. And I, again, I'm going back to the service providers. I think that this is an unwritten benefit because sometimes with ransomware, you may not trust the infrastructure in which you're restoring to. Well, sure, it could be compromised. Right, right. The, the individual in Canada, they actually, they, they had financial systems back and running within 24 hours, but it really took them the rest of the week because they had to rebuild the, the source data well, even center. if you're doing... Um even if you have a, a disaster recovery set up or using DRAS in the cloud or whatever, you still have the same problem. If you're pushing, syncing all of your bad data, your, your ransomware bits up to the sure. cloud or to your DRAS site, I mean, the, even even DRAS may not save you. Well, that's or, where... Or, or a DR site. Or, or IaaS that's available yeah, as yeah. a target. Well, yeah. that's where I really like a Veeam Secure Restore, which will do a scan to make sure there's no threats upon what you restore. I also really like Sure Backup because that will a verify what you have is recoverable, but then you can also spin that up in the data lab to say, does the behavior return? Is this okay? Yes, my application may say that it's okay, but is that dot lock file? It took you almost an hour to get to data labs. I thought for sure you would have oh, hit that. I love data labs. I know you do. I thought you would have gotten there earlier. No, I didn't. <laughs> Great. For people that don't know, I mean, do you want to do a minute on data labs? Yeah, sure. So uh, really quick on a data lab, it is the ability to take our backup, and it was initially meant as a technique to ensure that what we back up is indeed recoverable, okay? So in 2010, when this first release of the technology came out, Veeam implemented it in a way that we're reading the backup data read-only, and we're sending the writes somewhere else, but from a compute and a memory perspective, we're on a virtual uh, production host, like a VMware host, and now this is available for Hyper-V as well. And we would just power on these virtual machines to ensure that they are indeed recoverable, not just that they boot, mm -hmm. but that the application is right, the heartbeat is there, the ping is there, that type of thing. Well, that's kind of a gateway technology. So our orchestrator product is gonna use that to do more tests and verify more complete, like DR. But you could also take the data lab and let it go standalone and do a test. Test an upgrade, test a security scan, test a reconfiguration. I had one scenario, this is like two years ago when the Windows Server 2008 R2 end of life was getting hot and heavy. Let's test upgrading that to 2012 or let's test upgrading right. that to 2016. So the data lab is the test environment that you never knew you had. I asked him for a minute and he gives us five with oh, it was wiggle fingers at the end. Minutes. All right, so we've got a couple more questions here. Last last couple minutes to, to get in on the uh, the loot crate of uh, Raspberry Pi and and I'll we'll stuff it with some of the random stuff that you guys don't take. You know, I see we got some socks. Oh, there's another ten pairs of socks that aren't uh, band aids, aren't, aren't bandages. I <laughs> got security screens. I got a I don't know something to get spills off your shirt. Blaze is worried about Canadian printers being infiltrated. I guess you've scared the scared the hey. Canadians straight on printers <laughs> taking over. Hey, go to Dave Kula. He'll tell you about it. Uh, what about versioning backup? Is it secure? I think you want to put your backups on something that can't be tampered with, right? So um, I like the idea of encrypting my first copy of the backups. When I say encrypting, not like ransomware encryption, but like a Veeam encryption, because I don't want something to get into extortion mode right. uh, with my backup. And then secondly, I can have immediate feedback if there's been tampering with it. Um, the other thing is I, I have a general advice. Now I didn't do it in this lab environment, just because it's easy, uh, or it's easy to show. But you know, for organizations that are you know really concerned about this topic, I recommend that their backup infrastructure not have connectivity to the internet. Okay, because some of the dwell factors like to go assess and report. And the other thing is remote access to it. Again, I'm in a show lab, which is why I'm using what we've used today. But um, two-factor authentication into okay. that, you know, so that there's no accidental access. And then the third thing would be explicit minimal required permissions on different authentication frameworks. I mean, think about Linux, it's a collection of local accounts, right? Think about maybe a separate management domain with um, 
just for backups or just for you know non-production apps, those security level measures of abs- abstraction will really help you. Okay, we've got uh, one or two more here. Let's see, not a ransomware related, so. Okay, I can handle that. That's a good story. It could be sausage related, I'm not gonna tell you. Okay. Well, maybe I'll ask you the question. Uh, Does Veeam handle real-time replication? Um, We will soon have real-time replication. Mm -hmm. Uh, The version 11 will have Veeam CDP, which is a uh, replication engine built on VMware's vSphere APIs for IO filtering. Uh, so version 11, which we previewed at VeeamON, will have that. And it's in beta now. So, so you're moving along at pretty good speed on Yep, on that's looking good. We've uh, That's taken a long time. We announced that a little bit ago. But it's 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 locked in now. We're, okay. we're ready for it. It's okay. uh, it's in beta. So bug your SE if uh, if you're familiar with Veeam. And uh, that's that's fun. You now have all these SEs that want to have to get beta support for you. Good. Perfect. Yeah. I like that. And just... just to throw it out there because not everyone knows, but if you've got Veeam 10 now, when 11's available, your li- how does the licensing well, as lo- work? Well, as long as you're active on support, you're entitled to upgrades. Okay. And that's okay. also the beauty of our universal license, right? Because you might say, well, n- now that I have CDP, I'm going to convert this physical server to a virtual machine or something like that. The license is portable across okay. the uh, product so that a physical server, a virtual machine, cloud instance, um, Oracle database, they all take one seat. We got a uh, a question on the spelling of Veeam origin okay. story. Okay. Oh, uh, well, which story do you want? Well, so yeah. okay, so we'll have some fun with that here as we wrap up. So first of all, my kind of funny observation about Veeam, and this is my tenth year here at Veeam, and I kind oh, of great have, more more web searching. This is, uh, <laughs> here, let me let me let me Google this is things fantastic. for you. Fantastic! I'm sure everyone really loves the the in-depth this is the hard-hitting live stream yeah, that you so, get with, with rick and brian so let's take these two logos here here's our old one on the right actually we had an older one before that's yeah, got like a little nike swoosh action going yeah on. actually we had it backwards though we should have put it on the other direction because now it's like you're up and then it's down where it's like a backup and a restore is like you're down and we bring you up we should no one thinks that hard about logos what ask bugs, intel what, <laughs> they just spent a week educating people on the new intel logo. what bugs me brian is old logo had lowercase a and uppercase E's, and the new logo has lowercase E's and uppercase A. That old A looks like E.T. from the video game. Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of. And then we had, back here, we had the thin logo. Oh, now we that. have the body positive larger logo versus the non-bolded you logo. You guys have gone through. That's probably $18 million in logo design. No, not even through. close. We love having fun with it. But uh, the current one is the body positive or bolded logo, we call it. Um, so it's kind of funny, you know, sometimes we put things down in here like the, the tag lines from back in the day. But the, what does the word mean? Well, I, you know, there's a couple of answers uh, I can give you to that. One is just a simple play on words of, you know, VM, like a virtual machine. If you think about where we were back in the day, um, this word from a dot-com domain was available. So and that's a good, that's a good place point. to start. Well, you could, I mean, that uh, we know that because yeah. you know, storage review has been around since 98. But if you have some yeah. idea now, you can't just roll up to GoDaddy. Now you got to get like ZimFlab89, and that's probably And, and get gone. the German word for it. Oh, that would be available, out. maybe. But uh, yeah, so it's craziness, right? So uh, the word was available. It sounds like VM. And uh, the other kind of uh, janky story is that we needed to come up with the name, and it's getting late. It was 5.33 a.m., so think of Roman numeral and E's backwards, you know. But let's just go with play on words for VM. <laughs> All right, well, we've got a shout-out. Veeam is in the team going to implement Veeam 1 on Monday. So Hey, now. There we go. All that's right. That's a fast-acting. Cool. Conversion. I like it. I, I like it, too. All right, so Lucy's going to pick the winners for the Raspberry Pi. She'll put those in the chat. I, I still think the, the tape to go and the Woody has is, is got to be one of my favorites. You can never see if I remember. You can don't underestimate the amount of bandwidth you can have in a station wagon yes. full of tapes, or yes. something like that. That was Paul or somebody sent that. Yeah, so this will be available immediately for replay if you missed any of it. Uh, if you want to watch it over the weekend, think about what you've done. Gather the kids. Yeah, get around. <laughs> But anyway, Rick, thanks for coming down and, yeah. and making the journey. We hope you've learned something about ransomware. I don't know if I've learned anything at all from this. Well, most days you don't learn anything. But. <laughs> this is what happens when we spend a little too much time together over the years. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Really appreciate it.